Thank you for listening to the Performance Anxiety Podcast on the Pantheon Podcast Network. I am your host, Mark. And if anything good came out of the pandemic, it was projects like this new release by The Tripes. I'm joined by founding members John Baumgartner and Mark Francia. The guys talk about how the band formed with the goal of recording 145 for a local jukebox. But they do have connections to the influential band The Feelies. They also discuss some of the more unusual aspects of the band, like using a wind-driven keyboard and an experimental 360-degree surround sound effect. The band was only active for about three years, and this new release celebrates the band's 40th anniversary and expands on the original album by adding some live tracks and a couple of songs from a brief reunion from a few years ago. It's amazing that a band that was only around for a short time in the early 80s actually got a new life through Spotify. The album is available digitally and on CD through Pravda Records or Bandcamp, and a gatefold vinyl release will be available in the coming months. Follow the Tripes on social media, but make sure it's the Tripes from New Jersey, not Greece. Follow us at Performance ANX on social media, and you can help support our show with a coffee at ko-fi.com slash performance anxiety, picking up merch at performanceanx.threadless.com, or even just a review wherever you listen. I hope you enjoyed John Baumgartner and Mark Francia from The Tripes on Performance Anxiety on the Pantheon Podcast Network. John is our um, uh, our vocalist. Yeah, I knew you were going to put me in a forefront. <laughs> yeah, this is John Baumgartner from The Tripes and Speed the Plow, Young Wu, and many of the hailed in bands. And I'm very pleased to be talking with Mark Shea tonight on Performance Anxiety. Uh, talking about the 40th anniversary reissue of uh, the Tripes compilation, Music for Neighbors. Looking forward to speaking to him. I think John covered everything 100%. I knew he was going to say that. No, no, no. 40th anniversary, we're all proud of the release. And uh, yeah, looking forward to talking to you tonight. What I like to do... Before we get into the release, is to find out how we got to that point. So, uh, John, we'll start with you. How did you get into music in the first place? Was that big in your household growing up? Uh, were, you, were, you, were your fa- parents into uh, music at all? Or? It was sort of big in my household. My father was a singer in a choir and uh, had a phenomenal voice. And um, so, yeah, music was around. And as the dutiful son of two Hungarian immigrants. I started studying uh, accordion when I was seven years old. Nice. For about seven years until I could finally bail. Um, <laughs> but, it, but, but the one advantage that I, that still serves me today, I learned to read music and, um, uh, funny, a lot of, you know, very extremely accomplished rock musicians that I've played with over the years, can't say the same thing. So th- that helped. Um, but there was a huge period when I, I wasn't involved in music. I was writing poetry and prose and oh. going to college and um, uh, pursuing a career and stuff like that. Mark, on the other hand, did have kind of the more traditional experience for indie bands like us uh, playing in high school. All right, Mark. So, how did playing you... in high school rock bands? How did well, we... uh, actually, before high school. So, so kind of like John, I, I kind of have had a musical career in fits and starts with large um, periods of inactivity in between. But I mean, I started to get guitar lessons when I was very young because I had an older brother that was interested in the guitar, and he got lessons. And the guy who came by the house, the guy came to our house back in those days. Nice. And he told my mother, I'll give the little guy lessons. It won't cost any more. He just needs to have a guitar to play. And so we, we sealed that deal. Nice. So I, I started playing really young, but don't get the impression I know how to play well. It's because I started <laughs> young. Because I don't. So I played for a couple of years. I started when I was four. I played for like three years. And then going to what John said, it wasn't even in high school. I was in a band in seventh and eighth grade. Um, you know, which was a, a fantastic experience in yeah. seventh grade. My <laughs> name was the uncalled for F O U R at the end. <laughs> and then that was in 1966. I know that's going back a long time for you, Mark. Oh and man. In 1967, the same band 
but we changed our name because the times they were a change in, right? Oh. We changed our name to uh, Box Lunch, B-A-C-H apostrophe S, <laughs> Lunch. That was our band. And then, and then after that though, that was 67, I didn't touch a guitar until the tripe started uh, 15 years later. So wow. it's been like fits and starts, like I say. Oh, that's, that's pretty wild. And before we go too much farther, Mark, I do want to thank you for spelling your name correctly. <laughs> yeah. So. yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, it's going to be easy to remember the names tonight. <laughs> it's going to be very, 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 very simple. Very simple. <laughs> very simple. <laughs> so, all right. So you, John, you started with the accordion. Mark, you're on the guitar. When did you guys, John, I guess, when did you start thinking that music could be something to pursue? Um, well, John, I mean, if, if you're talking about, again, I didn't touch a guitar from the time, you know, from eighth grade in 1967 and told the tripes in 1982. So if you're kind of really asking, it's tantamount to asking me, like, how did we start the band? Um, because I had no musical activity, you know, in between then. Right. And, um, well, the long and short of it is, uh, uh it was, uh, El Bruce, who I, I think you've probably seen his name on, on the release. Yeah. He and I, you know, we had the idea of recording a song with the sole purpose of landing it in the jukebox of a local bar. Right. Cause the owner knew us and we just, <laughs> You know, we knew he would do it, you know, so like a vanity press, right? You know, right, yeah. So we said, we we need to make some music. We literally never had a band. We didn't do anything. So I said, I'll ask John and Tony, my friends, because John, I knew he played the accordion once before. And Tony, who he was married to at the time and still is today, um, you know, she's like a musical whiz. She's the only one of us that knew anything about music, <laughs> you know, really, I would say. So we got together and we started rehearsing and then, you know, things were going pretty well. I was playing an acoustic guitar. Tony was playing a woodwinds. Elbrus was singing and John had this, I, I'm going to let John describe it. He it's, had this uh, keyboard, this like a wind old... driven keyboard. I'm going to, I'm going to turn it over to him. Right. All right. Now. All right. It's a cheap old Italian keyboard, not an 88, probably a 48 key. Uh, that was plugged in, um, but it was wind driven. Uh, there was a fan blowing rather than as with a harmonium, you're producing your own wind or with an accordion, you're using the bellows. Yeah. This thing, you know, you turn and click the button, turn it on and you'd hear it like. Kind of like weezing. You know, kind of, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like bizarre. And there was a pedal underneath it that you could uh, move with your knee to sort of provide a little vibrato, um, but <laughs> the cheapest piece of crap imaginable. <laughs> uh, but, it, but it sort of suited what we were doing at the time, uh, which was really rudimentary stuff. Um, I, I don't know, speaking for myself, um, the feelies are going to come into this conversation yeah, pretty yeah. soon, obviously. And we were very aware of them and we're, we're friends for a long, long time with at least Bill, uh, who went to high school with us was in Mark's class and Glenn who lived literally a stone's throw from where grew up a stone's throw from where I'm sitting right now in North Elden. Okay. And knew my wife grew up together. So th they were part of the scene we knew what they were doing and the success they were having in the city. Um, but also in that period, there were things like, uh, you know, Gang of Four and Bush Tetras and uh, yeah. bands that weren't using much more than two or three chords. You know, gee, well, who else could I even say? You know, a Young Marble Giants was, you know, a huge early influence. Okay. Very, very simple approaches to music. And um, it was one of those things like, you know, the Velvet Underground sold no albums, but everyone who ever bought one started a band. Right. Well, it was sort of that mindset of, gee, you know, you can get away with a couple of chords and half a melody line and build from there. So um, that kind of, I don't know, was my early take on it. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. Without a healthy mind, 
Being truly happy and at peace is hard. The good news is, therapy works. But what is therapy exactly? It's whatever you want it to be. Maybe you're not feeling motivated right now and would like some tools to help. Or maybe you're feeling insecure in relationships or at work, not dealing well with the stress. Whatever you need, it's time to stop being ashamed of normal human struggles and start feeling better because you deserve to be happy. And now you don't have to worry about finding an in-person therapist near you to help. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can start communicating with your therapist in under 48 hours. Try doing that in person. So join the millions of people who are seeing what online therapy is really about. It's always a good time to invest in yourself because you are your greatest asset. And a special offer to Performance Anxiety listeners, you can get 10% off your first month of professional therapy at betterhelp.com slash performance anxiety. That's betterhelp.com slash performance anxiety. Thanks again to BetterHelp for sponsoring this podcast. Okay. Yeah, so, I mean, as, as John said, the feelings come into play because, you know, well, the first thing we want to dispel is the fact, you know, the band did exist before Glenn and Bill got involved. But with that said, I mean, you know, it goes without saying that their influence and, you know, what they brought to the band was, you know, monumental. So all of a sudden they got wind of what we were doing. I, I, I honestly don't even know how, again, we all lived in the same small town, but I, I don't know how they got wind of it. And they asked for a tape and we, we got them a tape and they loved it. And they're like, we, we want to record you. They had a four track, uh, you know, tape deck, this big giant thing. It's like the size of, you know, one of those little refrigerators you'd have in your dorm room. Yes. Right. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it was a big reel to reel type of, we, you know, it, it was very cool. The thing, right. Yeah. And, um, the, and then, so they invited us to come over and then record some of the songs and, and, uh, you know, again, it all went smoothly. And next thing you know, Glenn, you know, wanted to be in the band. We're like, Holy crow. You know, <laughs> what's going on here. <laughs> and, um, and, and that's kind of how it took off that, that, you know, and then it kind of took up right from there. How did you guys decide on the name, the tripes? Hmm. I, I think, you know, this is one of those things where like, I think I know the, the answer, but I'm not <laughs> sure. Go with it. Go. Yeah, yeah, no. Well, no, El Bruce, who was, you know, our, the, the lead singer, he was, um, you know, he frequented the New Jersey shore as many people from New Jersey do. Yeah. And, um, he did have an idea to call the band Surfside Brucey and the Tripes. I don't know why, I, but, but it was T R I P E S. I, I don't even know what the connection <laughs> between Surfside Brucey and the Tripes is, <laughs> but and what the what tribe has to do with the shore? Yeah, no, no, no. It, it, it doesn't have anything to do with shore. But that was the name. But that was his name for the band. And then again, us being, you know, growing up in the '60s, you you have to add a Y in instead of an I uh, in order to make things cool, right? Right. You know, the birds, B I R D S, right? Yeah. So circle. You put in a Y, and you're home free. So that that's kind of how it came about. Okay, so it got shortened and and vowels got switched around, changed. Well, we we, we vetoed the Surfside Brucey <laughs> part. So, I mean, that that didn't even get past like the first nanosecond. But the tripes, it's like uh, okay, you know. And sometimes I actually wonder: Do people out there who have never phonetically heard the name of the band is it like the trips to them, which has never been to us? Like right. I, I that, you know. But sometimes I think like, is that what that's, people think the name of the band is? I don't know, you know. But I, it, I it is. I feel like that's that's fine if that's yeah. The no, case. no, that's, that's perfectly that works. Fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, whatever you want, as long as you're listening. Yeah. And we had never had any problem from this Greek band who oh, yeah. I think was who then I think they began earlier. I think they began like mid seventies or so. They were quite popular. Kind of a a Greek psychedelic folk rock band called the Tripes and really? it's spelled with a Y. Oh my yeah, gosh. Which, yeah, which must, so which I guess means something in Greek, and I'm I'm embarrassed to say I've never Googled that. <laughs> Maybe it means 
stripes with an I in Greek. I don't know. <laughs> One never knows. But it's funny because they, as John said, they do exist. And like it, it, we really coexist very peacefully because whenever we post something, like they like it and vice versa. I mean, they seem like great guys. I've never met them, obviously. But uh, yeah, there's actually another band with the exact same name. That's, that's basically what's known in the... Uh, world of science as parallel evolution you know yes but, um, you know but it, it's interesting <laughs> look well, it up here. Good on it yeah <laughs> <laughs> all right so i looked it up tripes in greek translates in english to holes holes yeah oh. h-o-l-e-s oh. ah oh so. That's, okay. So there you go. Oh, the title of our next album. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I won't tell you what Tony just said across the room. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> uh oh. That's, I got an idea. Uh, that, that's interesting. Okay. Very interesting. At least that's what, that's what, when I typed in Tripes Greek, that's what Google sent me to Wikipedia, and that's what it says. Oh, I, I'm, I'm buying it. I have no doubt. Yeah. All right. I mean, Wikipedia is never wrong. <laughs> yeah when did you guys really start to record in earnest instead of going from like a, a single 45 to well let's just start writing more music was it pretty immediate yeah there was the, it was a pretty natural music writing process in the beginning l bruce had some lyrics i came up with some music mark and i came up with some music for some of it you know i had been i had done a lot of writing i was you know, submitting stuff to literary journals and all. So I had uh, uh, folders full of poetry and I thought, man, let me sift through this. And a few things are, you know, were almost used verbatim um, and wrote some music to it. And so I, I got kind of, as the band progressed over our two or three year span, I, I started writing a lot more of the music. Was Brenda wrote a few things or contributed lyrics, I guess, on one or two songs. But yeah, I kind of, I kind of hogged the songwriting role. So no, it was it was it musically and lyrically. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, like with anybody, you you might start out with just these very kind of rudimentary musical facility. And uh, you start doing it enough. We were doing it. We were playing a lot. I mean, our rehearsals, our weekly rehearsals were marathons. Uh, well, well, when he says playing a lot, he doesn't mean gigging around. He means we were sitting in <laughs> a room playing a lot. But, but yeah, we're, we, were, that, but. we were in Bill's basement recording demos a lot. I mean, we were spending a lot of time playing music. And sure. I right. uh, gravitated toward the piano, then finally bought a Farfisa. Oh, wow. Yeah, two keyboard Farfisa, VIP, <laughs> with, <laughs> with synthesalalum on it, which <laughs> is the most bizarre effect imaginable. What is that? Uh, it is kind of like a tone bending sort of thing, but it, it was it was like not just pitch bending it was tone bending as well just a really bizarre effect i don't think i ever used it except maybe in, in long practices opening up the third six pack of beer and <laughs> fool around in between songs with the synth slalom and i get a laugh out of everybody but i never used it on a song i've got to but, look um, that up and see what that sounds like <laughs> So we, you know, I don't know, we all got better, I think, playing. I mean, Tony didn't have to. She started out with a huge head start on this. <laughs> you know, she studied in college and was a performance major and uh. played multiple instruments and so brought a whole other coloration to the band that, uh, you know, frankly, you know, other groups we were playing with at the time at shows, uh, you know, didn't dream of having some of the instrumentation that we employed and didn't employ in some cases. I mean, you know, it was sort of almost forbidden to use cymbals on any songs until, oh, wow. you know, well, well into our career because... Yeah, Bill and Glenn were always felt like cymbals were sound killers. 
We'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. Hey guys, I want to talk to you about socks for a second. Why not? It's a music podcast. But I tried a pair of socks from Boldfoot and love them. I've only worn them once because my kids have stolen them. So in my household, that's the best endorsement I can give. And I guess it's fitting because the design I chose was jailbait. Wait, jailbird. The design I chose was jailbird. I might keep that in. The socks are 100% American made and 5% of all proceeds go to veteran charities. It makes sense seeing that Boldfoot is a family and veteran owned company. They have a huge variety of styles. So check out boldfoot.com and buy some of the best socks you've ever slapped on your feet and help veterans while you're at it. That's boldfoot.com. They were getting a lot more into recording. Uh, I mean, they were in a sort of transitional period. They they were in a, you know, they had sort of put the feelies on a shelf after Crazy Rhythms came out and all the hoopla surrounding that because I think they were really frustrated with the music industry. Um, And so we're, you know, stepped away from it, but they were still like highly active musically. They had formed the Willies, which was an instrumental band that had a rotating cast of characters, including most of us. (laughs) Um, They were writing um, the soundtrack for Susan Settleman's movie, uh, which one was it? The Tethering. Uh, yes, yeah, Smithereens. Oh, okay. Uh, which employed Feely's music, but original Willie's music and new instrumental stuff that they were working on. So they were still really active. And I, I think both of them viewed jumping into the Tripes Cauldron as like, you know, I, I know Glenn did an interview recently about this. He just said, you know, he was at a certain point with playing guitar, which he had done for years and years and years. And, you know, was at a sort of creative crossroads and welcomed the notion of, of playing drums and percussion with us, which he did exclusively in the beginning. Okay. And I think Bill's attitude, you know, on the production and doing the recording and stuff, and, you know, was, he was becoming a member of the band. And in fact, I mean, he was our sound man from our some of our earliest shows um, at Maxwell's and elsewhere, and then started playing percu- his percussion parts from the soundboard. <laughs> so we had sort of a a nice sort of three sixty thing going on in the rooms. That's you awesome. Know, sometimes, sometimes it worked well. Sometimes it didn't. I could always <laughs> tell when it worked well because. <laughs> he'd start playing a part from another side of the room. And if it's something like claves or tambourine, you're going to hear it. Yeah. And I, you know, I always like got a kick out of seeing people like looking around, <laughs> like, you yeah. know, I mean, Maxwell's didn't have a state of the art sound system. Yeah. So like, well, where's this coming from? <laughs> the um, beginning of surround then, sound. Yeah. And then, well, and gradually he joined us on stage. Um, at our at our seven member peak. Oh wow! Were you guys gigging a lot at that point? I mean, were, what by what point, Mark? You mentioned that you weren't doing a whole lot in the beginning. When did that really start to pick up for you? Well, we never, you know, we didn't play that often. Well, we would play well, locally. You should yeah, we, locally we played. There, there was a place in Hailden again, which is the town that we grew up in or near. Uh, it was called the Peanut Gallery. And uh, we actually put together, curated, if you will, some shows uh, because we were, you know, because of uh, Bill and Glenn's involvement, we were kind of introduced to the Hoboken scene, right? So we had played a show or two at Maxwell's and we kind of met these other bands, the Bongos and a couple other bands. And so we started to have local shows every Sunday night and hailed in, but invite those bands to come and they all thought it was a great idea. So in the sense that we were doing these very local, you know, I, I would say pretty low key shows that was on a regular basis, but as far as okay. playing in the city or, uh, in Hoboken, I mean, we did that from time to time, but not really that, that often. Okay. I have a, a couple questions about this. Now, you, there's a definitely a heavy like sixties folk influence in the music, uh, a, a plan, a plan revised.
God. The inner light. great songs Belmont Girl is mad at me yes there's got to be a story behind that song you you can't write a a song like that with just out of the blue Belmont Girl is mad at me Belmont Girl is sad to see standing on corners who let me I turn around she's not with me I laugh it off and walk away on the street it's the only way names change but the numbers stay Yeah, I don't want to. I mean, it's written by <laughs> L. Bruce about a girl from the area, and we who will have who will have to will have to tell her about this. Yes, we'll, about we'll, this we'll broadcast. <laughs> but 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 no, it's just basically uh, written by a guy who's digging the girl. I mean, it, it is you know the, the the words you hear are what they are. It was about you know a, a real person from our area. <laughs> Um, okay. although it's funny, I, I, I haven't heard this, hadn't heard the song in a while. And there is like a killer line in there. I think he says, standing on the sidewalk, like a tree, which I, I think <laughs> that's one of the lines in the song, which if that's what it is, uh, I love it, but uh, because those are L Bruce lyrics. There, yeah. but, um, <laughs> yeah. so, now, why does that, aside from the story, why does that song stand out or, or is, it, is it because of the story well, we should also we should add that B- belmont ave is oh, sort of well, the main um, drag through halden yeah thank you john connecting uh, halden and north halden it's sort of the artery oh, okay yeah, yeah. and uh, where all the bars are and where all the yeah well where all the places where people would congregate including bars are so yeah oh that's the belmont girl yeah i i see i'm taking that for granted it's like when you yeah. say some acronym and you don't even think about it but, right uh, yeah. that, that 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 does help okay yeah that that puts into pers- into some perspective it's so to the point you know, it, the, the yeah, title, yeah. Belmont Girl's Mad at Me. I just, <laughs> you know, I, but, but that's just it. The whole thing from the, yeah, so those songs after The Explorers Hold and then The Plan Revised, which was, you know, I kind of consider those five kind of together. The Plan Revised was recorded a year later for a compilation album, but they were okay. all done in a studio. But the ones that follow that are all home recordings with the original band with El Bruce. And that's just it. It's all to the point. The instrumentation is to the point. The words are to the point. Yeah. Um, it's it's just right to the point. So the Explorers Hold was released in 84, but by that point, you guys had kind of moved on from the tripes. If, if I'm getting the timeline correct, is, is, is that accurate? Well, we were still the tripes, but we moved on from the original version of the tripes. That, okay. Yeah, that's right. We, we, so, you know, this is our 40th anniversary. So 82 is when we started. So those home recordings, and it's pretty obvious which ones are the home recordings, I think. They, they were like 82 slash 83. Okay. And, and the Explorers hold was 84. <laughs> so by then, we had progressed to some degree, I would say. Yeah, yeah right. I mean, in, in those intervening years, you know, th- there was the original us with Glenn and, and then Glenn and then gradually build more on production and stuff. And then Glenn shifted from drums, eventually started having guitar ideas that, you know, to flesh out this material. Okay. Switch back to guitar and Dave Weckerman, the Feely's percussionist, uh, was our drummer for i want to say maybe a year Mm -hmm. we did a few shows in the city we did yeah i think we did maybe uh folk city i know we did a maxwell show with him but uh was our drummer and uh was 
unceremoniously let go at a certain <laughs> point. Uh -oh. You can, you can, you should interview Dave sometime. He's got a whole story about how I fired him on the phone on a snowy January night because I knew he couldn't, he, it, it was so bad out. He couldn't come over and punch me in the nose. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he insists that that was my motivation. But anyway, um, after that though, um, we're all pals now. I'm yes. We're, I mean, we've remained pals and I'm a member of young Wu. I'm still playing keyboards in his band whenever that happens. <laughs> Uh, but so then we, um, uh, Brenda and Stan entered the fold. Uh, Stan, I think, had been doing some percussion with the Feelies or uh, and with the Willies for sure. So he was coming into the you know the, the our musical world and has since come into the family in more ways than one. He's my brother-in-law. Oh and wow! Father of my niece and nephew. Um, and Brenda, what was, what was that connection, Mark? She was friends with Janice, and Janice... Ah, okay, I'm mean, getting friends. it from Tony. She was friends with Janice, yeah. my sister. Okay. Yeah, Janice Nicole. So she was the introduction there. So they joined the band. That became the seven piece um, of the Explorers Hold and the Plan Revised and everything that followed afterwards until our end, <laughs> which wasn't, which wasn't very long. Uh, it wasn't a long run. I mean, it was really from 82 to 85, right? So yeah, but, yeah pretty but, uh, much because when did um, the good earth come out? Was that 86? I think so. Yeah. So by early 85 or, you know, yeah, the feelings were already thinking about, doing feelies music again okay and and getting active as the feelies unfortunately for us they copped our rhythm section oh. i mean you know they obviously appreciated the incredible talents of stan and <laughs> brenda and so they reformed with them and i mean the tripes were in no position to uh say you know hey hang around here and play these infrequent gigs yeah. as opposed to recording a new album and touring the world right. Right. Uh, so you know and i mean we've all incredibly remained friends and collaborators all these years even up to the last year um, so there's never any issue about that, but uh, yeah, Mark and Tony and I were were left with uh, figuring out what you know what to do. A special thing I'd like to mention about this reissue, yeah, yeah, the the home recording stuff was on a reissue, beautiful reissue that Acute Records did ten years ago, but this new one includes material that came in over the transom from someone a recording of this showcase thing we did at the bottom line in 84. So I think we have three tracks from that. tracks that were done uh, five years ago um brief reunion of the band okay um we were recorded you know revisited a couple of earlier tracks and re-recorded them and since um uh, mark and tony and glenn and i have been working on two other new yet ancient songs so <laughs> songs that were in the catalog but that were never recorded or oh wow never more than demoed so we've got two new things in the hopper that are i guess will come out oh, this excellent. summer well you're you're going to be pissing off one dude in germany because there's a one copy of music for neighbors the 2012 lp for sale on discogs in germany for 108 dollars and 70 cents oh my god Ooh. So, well, you know, uh, <laughs> hope, 
hopefully that'll whet everyone, all the vinyl tripes fans' appetites for later this year when this whole thing comes out on Pravda on a gatefold vinyl release. Wow. Oh, don't, man. There's, I don't have a specific date for it yet, as you probably know, being involved in music, the, you know, vinyl production is... Uh the lead time is like eight, nine months oh, these days. Yeah, it's ridiculous. At least for, for an indie project, I guess not if you're Taylor Swift or, or Adele, whatever. Yeah. 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 <laughs> who are, who are, who are clogging up the fucking pressing plants? Am I allowed to use that word? Yes. It's a podcast. First on first. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, they're first online with the pressing plants because they're doing, you know, half a million or a million units. Yeah. And so they're 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 in head of, ahead of the line for you know a band that's maybe doing a thousand or five thousand. Yeah. So you've answered like five questions that I had. So that's that's awesome. I like the efficiency. <laughs> we're, yeah, we're pretty good. So, do you guys, when Speed the Plow plays live, do you guys uh, incorporate any of the tripes material into the set, or going forward, will you to kind of help promote the tripes anniversary album? Um, you know, we, we haven't talked about doing anything live. I mean, the, the last two years have put a whole different spin on the notion of out playing live to sure. begin with. We've been, you know, Speed the Plow, we, we put out a release um, last October of material that we recorded uh, during the pandemic before and after silence. Um, which you can speed the plow com, and we've been so and and the tribes have been doing this recording. Uh, we've got a new kind of weird version of the Speed the Plow band back together again. <laughs> we've been sort of revisiting our early catalog and reimagining some material. Okay, so I, I kind of feel like we're sort of busy and still involved yeah. musically. Um, playing out live, I, I don't know, Mark, I guess the idea of doing something maybe when the, the album comes out in the fall. Yeah, no, I, we, we would have to consider, I mean, believe it or not, I, I know it sounds incredible, but we, we've literally never had a discussion amongst ourselves. It's <laughs> never been, should we do it? Should we not do it? So uh, it's food for thought. We'll have to think about that. That's a perfectly good question. But as John said, the, you know, the album won't be out in, until the fall prop that didn't want to wait to hold up the CD um, until the album came out, which is, you know, kind of unorthodox, but you know, whatever, that's what they want to do. And we were on board. So maybe when the album does come out, because like John says, it's a, uh, it's a gatefold album. You know, you, you finally, you finally hit it. I, I don't remember who I was telling, maybe my brother or somebody, I said, I finally have a gatefold album, right? Isn't that, <laughs> right? Isn't that, the 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 goal of everybody you know like dream. sergeant pepper that was gatefold so uh, you can't get any better than that right so you reached I, the finally got, I finally got to design a gatefold album my, yeah, yeah. my first oh, i mean nice. just going back just going back to a 12 inch format is like mind bending enough for sure but then to have a 12 by 24 <laughs> it's like amazing <laughs> took me a while to come to grips with yeah <laughs> but you've done it you guys have reached the pinnacle yeah well as long as you know as long as you can still clean your weed on it and have all the seeds drip out and because <laughs> i mentioned to a few people that you know it's coming out as a gateful album who are aren't you know maybe music types mm -hmm. and like what is that what is that and i'm like that's when you used to have it, like you'd open it up and you clean all the seeds and stems out of your weed. And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> they all had their own specific one they used yeah. for that purpose. Oh, I get it now. <laughs> Probably a Yes album. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tommy, you're right. Oh, there you go, yeah. So is there um, a social media presence or a website for the, for uh, the, the tripes music or is it everything through the speed, the plow? Uh, tripes NJ dot band camp, whatever the band camp thing is. Okay. 
Um, yes, there are. Uh, well, there's a, the tripes on Facebook. You just started it, right? Yeah, you know, around this project. Okay. Um, so yeah, the tripes NJ is probably a good thing to look for on Facebook, on Instagram, and on Twitter. Perfect, and that'll give so, that'll give information on how to order the music and and. Uh, yeah, well, I'd say first for, for to order music, uh, pravdamusic.com Perfect. is the home base. But but you can also order. CD, digital, and eventually vinyl through the Bandcamp page as well. Okay. Oh, actually, yeah. When when vinyl finally comes, yeah, it's all covered. Um, I mean, we're we're even on Spotify again, which which, interestingly enough, is what led to this project even coming out. Oh, really? You got a minute? Um, yeah, we got about four. <laughs> the 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 daughter of Ken Goodman, the owner of Pravda Records youngish person I'm imagining early 30s this unbeknownst to everybody became a and and Pravda there was a connection there because uh, Glenn Mercer I think they put out a Wake Ulu album or two and okay. Glenn's solo album or maybe two of those two and I think they're reissuing some of that so go to Pravda to check that out as well Glenn had a relationship. Uh, we didn't know that Ken's daughter, Lily, was this incredible Tripes fan and loved listening to us on Spotify. And her and her friends were big fans. And wow. We, we weren't even aware that we had a Spotify presence. I, <laughs> I guess the, um, the, the, our friend Dan, who runs Acute, who did the reissue 10 years ago, must have started a Spotify but then it disappeared for, I guess, maybe, I don't know, the statute of limitations ran out and the uh, Spotify page disappeared and she put this whole ball into motion. Uh, that's awesome. It got so late, too late for goodbyes, too late for songs of joy. Guests are all pale It got so dark Too dark for games of sin Too dark to find a path Guests are all pale Dark continents before my eyes Drums pounding all through my brain Continents before my eyes Music is sad, there's no straight path 